and what I learned with mistakes, then what should one should not do. So it's a kind of a mixed bag. The first thing that I learned back in my fellowship was most importantly, you have to have a strategy when you handle any patient, refractive, cataract, glaucoma, detachment, whatever. You just can't vaguely sit down and start discussing because the flow doesn't come. And when the flow doesn't come, the confidence is not uh, transferred to the patient. What I tend to do for all patients is have a very dedicated time slot. I call all my pre-ops in the afternoon time, which is the lean time of the clinic, somewhere from 1 to 4. And uh, because my entire staff is free or relatively free to cater to them, and uh, the processes are fixed. The patient comes, gets a refraction done, gets all the investigations before dilatation. And so the flow is set for the patient. And needless to say, there is a very dedicated team that's available at that point in time for the patient. So we all know who the good patient is and my cutoff was 20 but I put it down to 19 now because people come for defense surgeries and so one has to do. And the first thing that one wants to do is a good refraction. Uh, I have set refractionists for this because I don't let all the refractionists do my LASIK pre-op refraction uh, because I need that level of confidence. I'm just going to show you a couple of cases in the middle like this very classical 28 year old well educated student who's working on a computer has been somewhere, has been advised surgery. Very typical. And that's the patient's refraction, it's just a screen grab, so just a low myo. One thing I've realized is low myos can be sometimes a little tricky because one, they are extremely motivated for a smaller number. And second, they can be issues underlying. Like in this patient, when we did a cyclo refraction, which hardly any of us will do for a myo, the refraction went down completely to minus 0.5 which essentially shows that this is an accommodation spasm that's being played out, has been advised surgery elsewhere and probably would have undergone surgery also. So one thing I learned is best if you can and if your time affords and the patient is, uh, you know, is comfortable with getting dilated and coming back after a few days again because cycloplegia, unlike uh, dilatation, will take some time for the pupil to come back, particularly if you are doing pupil registrations and you want to do a LASIK surgery on these patients. So this patient was counseled against surgery. And I would always say beware of low myopes because there's more at play than low myope. It's very juicy. We all feel very happy when we see a low myope because we know they are sure shot candidates for surgery. But they're also tricky and we can burn our fingers sometimes. And then we realize that there is no objective way to assess refraction. No, there is the only way is subjective. You do an auto ref, but you have to put the patient and you have to rely on the patient's refraction and whatever they read. And so we decided that there should be one more way or a couple more ways as the technology evolves to see how we can do this. So we did a study where we tried to see if we can create a model using artificial intelligence where we can predict the refractive error of the patient based on bio ocular biometry. So to put it forward again, we picked up a thousand eyes with the, these patients optical biometry because when we started we had an optical biometer. One eye of the patient was uh, included in the study, their biometry was fed in. Now this is a cohort of refractive surgery patients, so we know the refraction and we know the biometry. We teach the model that this is the refraction and for this refraction, this is the patient's biometry. Biometry is everything, you know. And then all axial length, white to white, corneal diameter, aqueous depth. And then we reverse engineer and we ask the model that this is the biometry and not tell me the patient's refraction as a predictive algorithm. Just to show you. This patient, uh, so this was our data, biometric data, and we used XG Boost. And this is how we would predict and if the model plays out. Uh, the model has been designed by Dr. Ashok Puri, who is a very senior ophthalmologist back in our practice. So here we fit in the data, as you can see, uh, picking up right from the optical biometer on this side. And I'll just go ahead, you know, in, when the moment we click predict the refraction sphere, it predicts a sphere of 3.09, and the patient's manifest is 3.75. So it's almost there. It's a it's it's very small data set. So it's not as accurate, but it's almost there. We did the same. So the predicted refraction is 3.09. We, we saw in our occasion series that there was a very strong correlation between manifest and predicted, which is a good thing because it gives us another option. In same way for astigmatism, it gives us another tool where we can assess these patients, maybe put in their biometry in my formula and see if the biometric uh, calculation shows a significant difference, then maybe cycloplegia the patient because it's very difficult in today's practice to cycloplegia all patients for uh, LASIK surgery. Again, uh, after this, uh, after refraction, I think ocular surface is predominantly very important and all of us have gone wrong uh, with dry eyes, not only because the patients are uncomfortable, because sometimes you can wrongly pick up the wrong refractive error. 
So this is just to show you, you can use your topographies. Buy any buy a topography, look for a dry eye module rather than buying a separate dry eye module because these will come incorporated particularly in Placido topographies. Uh, you can do a lipid, anal uh, lipid layer analysis using a lipid view or meibomian gland analysis which is also a good idea which I have now incorporated as a standard protocol in my pre-operative workup for these patients. In terms of corneal topography, Placido is probably the best when it comes to ocular surface evaluation of regularity of corneal astigmatism but it's some, it, cannot pick up it cannot pick up aberrations like corneal thinning or posterior corneal ectasia which can best picked up using shine flug imaging or OCT based imaging now. And so this is, I think, if you're doing a refractive practice of your own, I think this is one of those prerequisites that you must should have because it gives you a lot of data on anterior and posterior cornea. And I think it's now becoming a norm more and more. But still practices do use uh, OCD pachymetry or contact pachymetry along with topography, which is not a great idea because you can miss out on these subtle problems that may manifest later as ectasia. Give you an example of this patient who looks pretty okay on a surface topography. But if you look at the posterior corneal float I mean, and the corneal Mackey map over here, you can make out that this is a form frust conus in formation. And this patient will land up with ectasia if you do a refractive surgery for this patient. Okay, OCT. I, I tend to use epithelial mapping. Uh, I'm sure uh, you know, somebody's picked it up in the morning. But epithelial mapping gives me a huge amount of data, particularly when it comes to chronic contact in users because they will have epithelial irregularities. And sometimes patients can lie to you that they've stopped using contact lenses. So it's best that if you have access, you can look at the epithelium of these patients. I do biometry for all patients, not for predicting refraction, but I document the biometry because these patients will need to undergo cataract surgery at some point in time. And we know that preoperative biometric data can help in getting the right IOL power. So I do a biometry and mail these biometries to all patients and I also hold them as a database inside the hospital. Uh, again, all investigations need to be done in mesopic conditions because it's those white pupil patients that will end up with the most problem and you need to choose your zone size very carefully. This is just to show you on an eye trace aberometer that if you look at the patient's vision, we all check our patients' as nice brightly lit refraction rooms and this is what the patient reads. But the moment you dim the lights in your room, you will realize that they will lose a line or two of vision. They will go from 6.5 to 6.9 plus. And that's because the mesopic pupils will cause more corneal aberrations to open up. So it's very good to always assess and do all your investigations under mesopic conditions so that you know what is the worst case scenario for this patient and go ahead and treat that. Going ahead, uh, one thing that I do in all patients again is a specular because you don't want to operate on a pure specular and I'll tell you why. And this is a classical example of a patient who's a baker who, come, who came to me, uh, works in very hot environment, glasses are slipping off, there's fogging, hundreds of issues with myopia and this is his refractive correction. Everything looks okay, I, it's a very small print but the pachy is okay, uh, but this is the specular. I mean the peripheral cornea may be regular but with a specular like this, it's very difficult to counsel the patient for any ICL surgery. But it's also not a good idea to do a flap based procedure because the flaps may not adhere if the endothelial pump is not working. So I did a trans light or a stream light, a trans PRK procedure on this patient and the patient is doing well. This is the patient's post operative outcome. So the choice of surgery changed for me based on the specular itself, just the specular because I don't want to risk him ex moving his flap away five years down the line or who God knows if the flap doesn't adhere, it will become a big mess for me. So if you have a specular, it's best to do one. Otherwise, at least do a thorough slit lamp evaluation and look out for these gut tape changes. Another case scenario, uh, standard profile, 25 year old married female with a low myopia has come for surgery. Packy is 549, cornea is regular. Everything looks pretty nice. Nice juicy surgery to do. And specular is nice. Epithelial mapping is good. It's a little bit of dry eyes which can be managed. There is a lot of mebovin gland loss in one eye, but it's nothing that's manifest. The patient's comfortable. But I want you to see the video of when I'm operating. So this is the FS200, the femtosecond laser, and I'm docking the eye. And everything looks reasonably good to me once I dock the eye. And for those of you, uh, you know, who are, who are doing, this is a, this is a two-step procedure. So you have vacuum one and then you have suction two. And I'm firing a 9mm flap in this patient. So as you can see, the uh, dock is straight up, there is no problem, the flap is following completely. But have a look at what happens right now. So, with a normal looking eye, if you see something like this coming out, 
something's definitely wrong because this was a clean dog there was no there was no bubble there was no dry cornea there was no nothing but this is an area of uncut tissue it's very evidently clear that this is an area of uncut tissue for some reason so anyways uh, this is just to show you the other eye of the patient which i did fire because i had no idea uh, you know what that what happened in the first place because everything looked okay and the other eye fired extremely well and the flap was cut in the other eye so going back let me see if the examiner plays so this is the first eye and if you notice i'm trying to figure out what happened in this eye but notice the entire epithelium this is not the flap actually this is just the epithelium and the whole epithelium is moving smoothly over the area of uncut tissue i mean this is i mean i've been 10 years into practice doing refractive surgery and this is the first i encountered the flaps been cut but the epithelium is a little boggy so i didn't do anything to this eye i put a bcl left this eye but i ablated the other eye and this is to show you once again i lifted the flap for the other eye let me see okay let me go back to this if it works yeah but when i was ironing notice the other eye there's a central island of epithelium that's just floating in the center so definitely something is wrong with the epithelium i figured maybe my uh, nurses have put more proparacaine which is normally my protocol is on the table one drop and that pretty much does it for me but obviously they had it and this was the patient post operative day one in the in the eye where i didn't cut the flap and this is how it looked this is how it subsided to eventually and eventually it finally went away with this was epithelial basement membrane disease or ebmd which was missed out by me the only thing i had to do was look at the patient in retro illumination and this is what it was actually we take images uh, dilated images and this is what it was but i missed out because i've never encountered it and there's no way to pick it up because what what investigation can you do i'm doing everything from epithelium down to retina but i missed this out and this did happen so i did a prk for this eye later 3 months down the line and the patient is doing extremely well she's recovered back to 6 by 6 but it was a nightmare for missing out something and i still dog but i still i shouldn't have fired but i didn't see anything where i would have stopped firing so again not to get into details but microkeratoma you have more chances of having an epithelial loss of microkeratoma surely because of friction so femtom may be a better procedure but the best is prk one last case before i uh, come to the concluding slides of another patient and i have cut down the slides because i think dr vikas has already shown so 45 year old female comes to me for surgery and uh, profile is good she understands presbyopia she understands that she is going to wear reading glasses and she is heavily made up you know very i would say very pretty looking uh, 45 year old and we said surely let's go ahead and do a surgery but she comes on the day of surgery and i told her specifically no makeup no perfumes and she has all these fine reticular vessels on the face in these telangiectasias which i never saw in the pre operative so i realized there is some atopy there is something at play which is not normal but i went ahead and did a surgery and i landed up with a ctk which took at least 6 months to clear and the hyperopia is still there and patient turned out to be a nightmare again nothing you can do so i just wanted to put this up to say that you know you don't have to look at the eye but look at the patient profile but when i saw the patient in the theater it got me worried finally please look at the retina and send to your retina colleagues because peripherally these patients will have issues also i do uh, oct for all these patients because i need to document and for even for my comfort we did publish that in patients not for refractive but for cataract if in a normal looking retina you can have subtle pathology so no harm in doing it if you have an oct so finally understand the patient in totality rather than understanding just the eye understand the uh, the visual requirements and the personality type get a physician's clearance if you think the patient's not uh, you know has obes or uh, any other issue but please sit down and give enough chair time to explain the patient and realistically speaking everything is within plus and minus 0.5 and there's no zero zero because the eye is dynamic so the vision will fluctuate for these patients and with this you'll have a good post operative outcome more often than not thank you thank you so much i think uh, actually you've laid down the basics very well if there are any comments or any suggestions or anything that one anyone would like to share i also had a learning lesson from you i had this uh, i think i heard this talk in iskris and yesterday only i had a, a low myo 0.75 and minus 1 and usually i go more about giving my juicy speech of how easy and how it's going to be cake walk but then i did the cycloplegic refraction and i exactly landed where you did so i think it was a great learning lesson for me that you know